Well, great. Thank you. Well, thank you for much for having me. I'm sorry that this had to be uh, through videotape and not in person, but I think it's probably the safest thing to do. Uh, I appreciate uh, your invitation to speak to you uh, regarding uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. Now, when I spoke at the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, this was the title of my talk, Inevitable Pandemic. I think I can safely go ahead and just say it's the pandemic of COVID-19. The World Health Organization has not labeled this a pandemic yet. They said that this morning that they did so because they felt a pandemic was something that was run rampant through different communities and they feel it's more in control, this disease is more in control in most communities except for, except for a notable few. But clearly it meets the definition of pandemic and that is a worldwide disease with community transmission on more than two continents. And that is the case. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the historical perspective that these diseases has ha have happened before and, and uh, uh, some, some comparisons to other new diseases that have cropped up. A little bit about what the disease is, what, what the virus that causes it is, and what the COVID disease is actually like. We're going to talk a lot about epidemiology and spread and, and try to get an idea of what is, is Head, headed for us down the line, um, but things are changing very rapidly. Uh, like just last night, we learned that there were three cases in the Johnson County area, and that was brand new. And so things are changing very, very quickly. But I'll try to give you some recommendations on protecting your own health and doing travel. Your community here is doing a fantastic job screening people at coming in at the front door, um, restricting large uh, gatherings like the ones we're not having right now, and on the other things is, is the right approach um, for, this, for this condition. So let me take a step back and talk about some historical context. This is important because it's important to understand that new diseases happen all the time. It's happened before, it's going to happen again. So let's look back at history. In 1346, in the Crimea, in the town of Kaffa, it's a Genoese trading post, and it's under siege by the, by the Tartan army. And, and a mysterious disease breaks out among the Tartans, and they take some of the diseased bodies that have fallen ill from this, uh, from this disease, and they lob it over the walls into the city to try to intimidate uh, the Genoese. Well, the Genoese manage to escape. They get, they get in their ships. They sail back to Italy, and the first place they land is Sicily. And when they do, the rats that are on their ship get off and they take up residence in the thatch roof of huts uh, of the town. And that is then the flashpoint for the Black Plague, for the Black Death. And for the next 12 years, it rages across Europe and loses, Europe loses a third of its population. You have a new disease introduced into a susceptible population. In 1918, in Army Barracks in Kansas, you get an outbreak among military recruits. It's certainly not unusual, especially for people in a closed environment like the barracks. But what was unusual about this disease was its high attack rate among otherwise healthy 20 and 30 year old men. At this point, you see outbreaks of this influenza throughout the world. Uh, World War I is going on at this, time, at this time, and because of all the disease, it hastens the end of World War I. And in November of that year, when the war ended, all those soldiers come back. They mobilize back to their home countries, and you get this second wave of, of disease throughout the world. Eventually, a third of the planet is infected with the Spanish influenza, and 20 to 50 million people die. In 1976, in August, in the Ambuku Hospital in, Z in, uh, in Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, a patient shows up to the hospital with this strange vomiting and diarrhea illness, and there's blood in his body, blood in his diarrhea, and he dies. And the needles used, the syringes used on that patient are washed and reused in other patients. Of the original 318 cases, 280 people die from this new disease. It's an 88% mortality rate. 
and the disease is named for the river nearby, the Ebola River. In 1981, at the hospital I trained at, UCLA, there was uh, a series of men that had these strange opportunistic infections, a series of multiple fungal infections in the same body, which hadn't really been seen before, except maybe in transplant patients. And the infection disease specialist at the time, Dr. Gottlieb, measured their, their CD4 cells, their, 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 their white blood cells, special kind of white blood cell, and they found that their CD4 count was zero. And he wrote up a paper and, he, and, he submitted, and it was published by the CDC describing this case series of five homosexual men with opportunistic infections. And that was the first report of AIDS. And then finally, more recently, in 2003 in Hong Kong, uh, there was a doctor from southern China who checked into the uh, Hotel Metropole. And he stayed in the ninth floor of that hotel. And he was sick, he probably had some vomiting, he definitely had a fever, he might have touched the rails, uh, he might have touched the, the, the buttons in the elevator, uh, he, I think he vomited on the carpet near the elevator. And if you were staying in that hotel on that floor that particular day in February 2003, you were exposed to SARS. Uh, that uh, Chinese doctor had traveled from the, the southern from southern China, and where the disease had been going on since November uh, the year before, and the Chinese hadn't told anybody. And so that then anyone who went home from that floor then created these outbreaks, created these pockets of disease throughout the world, whether it be other parts of Hong Kong or into going back to Vietnam or Singapore or Toronto, Canada. And you saw that those were then the epicenters um, for the SARS epidemic. Now, what these diseases have in common is that you have a new disease going into a susceptible population and then spreading because of human contact, because of spreading because of industrial practices, spreading because of travel. This is a, uh, a map showing all the airline flights in the world. All those little yellow dots are airline, are airline flights. And, and you go across the world, as day turns to, to night, night turns to day, you see an increase, you see a change in the number of cases all over the place. The, um, and what's notable about this, this graph is you see the just intense number of dots over the United States. Um, and dots over China, there's dots over Japan, and you see a lot of travel in areas. So you can see if you have a disease in those areas, you can see how they could spread so easily to other places. What you don't see in this picture, there's very few, is there's very few dots over Africa, and over West Africa in particular. And we had the Ebola epidemic that happened in 2014, we had 10,000 cases. It remained largely in Africa, simply because there isn't, there isn't much travel from that area. Now we're seeing with COVID, we're not seeing a lot of cases in Africa. There's not a lot of travel by air to those areas. So what is SARS? What is COVID? COVID is caused by SARS-CoV-2. This is the name for the virus. It just means the second SARS coronavirus. Um, that's what it looks like. All these little um, red knobs on the virus are these receptors, are these places where it binds. And you look at it and under an electron microscope, it looks like a ring, it looks like a crown. And that's where the name coronavirus comes from. Corona means crown. And what those receptors are, that's where the virus binds them to the body. In the case of SARS, it binds to a receptor in the lungs called ACE2, uh, it just means angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, that's a receptor for SARS. We presume that SARS could be binds to a similar area. But what's different? What's different about this disease is it can definitely bind to the upper respiratory tract, not just the lungs, but the nose as well, the nose and the pharynx. And that produces runny nose, congestion, cold type symptoms. And it makes it very easy for it to be transmitted. Um, it's more easily spread from person to person. I can guarantee you that everybody watching this video has had a coronavirus in the past because coronavirus is one of the causes of the common cold. So what do we see with COVID? Most cases are mild. Most cases are mild. 80% of a patient's cases, um, they barely have any symptoms at all. They might have a cough, a dry cough, they might have a runny nose, um, they definitely have a fever, and that's about it. 
But about 15% of cases will get so significant, will be such a severe symptoms that the patients will want to go to the hospital. And that time frame between when they get sick before they actually show up to the hospital is about five days. So about five days they get sick, they get progressively more sick, and they finally decide they have to go to the hospital. And if everybody who gets the disease, about 5% will end up in the intensive care unit, ICU. Um, now, that 120 doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot when you multiply by the large number of people in an area um, like China, like Italy. Um, we've got a lot of cases. Um, you're going to have a lot of a, a tremendous need on the healthcare system, a tremendous need for ICU beds, for intensive care beds, for ventilators. I thought it was very interesting was what's the, what's the mortality rate? And there's a huge debate about this right now. And you're hearing numbers anywhere from 0.1% from to 1% to 3%, 3.5% or higher. And what is the actual mortality rate? When we're talking about mortality rate, we're talking about the case fatality rate. I mean, what proportion of people with the disease um, end up dying from that disease? And if you look at the mortality rate in Wuhan, China, over time, the mortality rate at the beginning of the disease was very high. The mortality rate now is running around 2%. What does that mean? Well, that means a couple things. Basically, that the initial presentation, the initial cases that, were, that, that developed, that were identified, that were noticed, that were seen, were bad. People got really sick, got up on a, ended up on a ventilator, ended up in the ICU. Those are the first cases tested first cases tested, and the asymptomatic, that 80% of patients who have very mild symptoms, they went initially went unnoticed. So at first, it seemed like the mortality rate was very high. So as you increase testing, as you have increased widespread testing, you're going to see a drop in that mortality rate. Certainly, um, if you have patients that tend to be older, tend to be sicker, have uh, coexisting conditions, they're going to have a higher mortality rate as well. There was some thought that maybe experimental therapies have had some benefit in China as well, and that's possibly related to, to, to some decreasing in the mortality rate. But it's mainly due to increased testing. Currently, the mortality rate in the United States is over 3%. That will drop as we increase testing. What's it going to end up to be? I don't know, but probably around 0.5, maybe 1%. The important thing for you People listening to this presentation is that unfortunately you are in the highest risk category for this disease. When you look at the mortality rate by age, it is tremendously skewed toward, toward the older ages. And those over 80 are really at higher highest risk uh, for death from this disease. And it's really significant. On the other hand, your grandchildren will be fine. Kids, college students, are almost unaffected. Very rarely will, will occur in age 20. There have been only a few cases in people under 15. So it's really rare in the younger population. But the older population is pretty significant. This mirrors what we see with flu. Flu is dangerous to the very, to the very old, but also for the very young. But COVID, it is more dangerous for the very old. And so I think that's important to understand. Again, what kind of symptoms do you see? You see fever, you see cough, you see fatigue. Um, if you measure the white blood cell count, the white blood cell count may be low. One of the most reliable ways of, of, of diagnosing this early, even before the tests come back, is by CT scan. So if you do a, C, a CAT scan of someone's chest, you can see in those lungs, you can see the infiltrates, you can see the, the uh, development of fluid in between um, the, the air cells of the lung, in between the bronchioles. And that's called interstitial infiltrates. And you can see that in the chest x right here. And you can imagine if this gets really bad, that your lungs fill with fluid, it becomes very, very difficult to breathe. This is called ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Okay, so where did this come from? We don't really know. Of course, we know about the uh, market, uh, live market in Wuhan, China. This email from ProMed Mail, which is, the, uh, which is a service that, that sends out messages about new diseases. I get a 
collection of these emails every week in my inbox. Um, and this email was the first announcement that this disease was out there. It was an announcement in the popular press in Wuhan about the closure of the wildlife market that happened on January 1st um, of this year. So it had been going on in Wuhan for at least a month prior to that. Um, so, but the only time the, the rest of the world found out was when the market was closed. Going back and looking at the actual cases of the market, there's not just one point when everyone gets sick. It happens over a period of time. That suggests that the, 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 the leap, the jump from animals to humans probably occurred prior to the market. And the market was an opportunity for people for the disease to spread from human to human. Not necessarily animal actually at the market introducing the disease there. Although this, this disease does come from an animal of some sort. So how did China identify? How did China know? How did how they ever spot the fact that this new disease was out there? Well, going back to SARS, remember SARS? SARS was kind of scary. It started in southern China. We now know it's been traced to a civet cat, which is like a mongoose, which was also sold at these, um, these markets. And ever since then, they've had a surveillance mechanism for pneumonia of unknown etiology, or PUE. And these are pneumonias where people are really sick, they're not responding to antibiotics, they might have a low white blood cell count, they're in the ICU. We don't know why they have this pneumonia. That's called a pneumonia of unknown etiology. And there's a mechanism in China to report these PUEs to their national CDC, to the China CDC. And you look over time, those spark, spikes in reports of PUE have been tied to new diseases, SARS, and then to avian influenza. So we, we identified a bird flu from these um, spikes in cases of PUE. And they've noticed that when, they, when an area has a spike in PUE, if they go in and they close that live market, the LPM or live poultry market, live bird market, if they close the live bird market, then you see a drop off in the number of cases of those PUEs. Clearly, there's a link between um, that live bird market and, 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 uh, and pneumonia of uncertain, of un unclear etiology, PUEs, of new diseases and a bird flu. So the question is, why do you continue to have the live markets in the first place? And this relates to a question I get all the time, is why do these things always start in China? SARS started in China. Avian flu started in China. COVID started in China. Why do this thing always start in China? Part of it is that live market. Part of the fact that is that this is a picture showing uh, what a live market might look like, where animals are butchered at the point of sale. So animals right there are cut um, and served uh, to people that are going to be eating them. They're live up until then. They might excrete themselves void uh, into their cages. Um, there might be contamination from blood or from other uh, body fluids at the point of butchering, the, uh, at the point of sale. And part of it is simply a numbers game. It's simple math. China is a place where you have lots of people and lots of birds and lots of pigs. And that intermingling between birds and people and pigs is what generates new influenza viruses. We know that. Um, and it certainly can lead to other viruses as we've seen in the case of coronavirus. It doesn't always start in China. Now, the last time we had a pandemic, a true pandemic, was 2009, H1N1 influenza. And where did that start? That started in Mexico, on a pig farm in Mexico. So what's the animal reservoir for, for coronavirus? We don't know. For the COVID, there is a theory out there that is the pangolin. A pangolin is a mammal that's covered in scales. It is raised for food, it is raised for, raised for traditional medicine in China, as well as it is poached from the wild hunted to near extinction now in the wild because of the scales that are used in traditional medicine. Um, we don't know it's the pangolin, that's only been one theory, um, but if it is, maybe people will leave the pangolin alone for a while. One negative we've seen from this disease is, is the amount of, of, of racist um, reactions that people have had to Asian people and to Chinese. Now this is nothing new um, to be bias against immigrants for fear of disease. That's been going on for hundreds of years. But this certainly, the most recent epidemic, has brought it up again. 
And I have lots of examples from my colleagues in emergency medicine in the ER who report these things. Uh, for example, in Ohio, there was a colleague who was taking care of a patient, a woman who had severe respiratory distress. They put a tube in there, a breathing tube in her mouth, um, and when they're done, the nurse looks at the patient and says, oh, this must be coronavirus. And the doctor says, how can you tell? And the nurse says, well, look at her nails. Her nails just got done, or, or, or she just got her nails done. You know what kind of people work in nail salons, right? Another one was a patient was sent into the ER by their physician, by their primary care physician, because he's a student. Because he's a student um, who's sick, and he goes to college with Asians, and therefore that's enough of a risk. One patient came in because they were concerned they got sick after eating bok choy, because that's Chinese cabbage, and that was a concern. There is certainly a need for increased testing, but we need to be reasonable about it. One of my messages for you today is that it is okay to be scared, but I don't want you to panic. And UC Berkeley, the student health, when this epidemic started, they tried to send the same message to their students, saying it's okay to be scared. These are normal feelings you're going to have, you're, you're have when you have an epidemic like this. And included on their handout of normal reactions is xenophobia. That's not a normal reaction. It's a common reaction. It's not a normal reaction that we're not going to tolerate. This is an animated uh, diagram showing the expansion of the disease around the world, the growth of the disease in Wuhan spreading to the rest of the world. We're initially spread to Japan, to Singapore, um, to South Korea. It's entirely predictable based on common flight patterns. Remember that chart with all the yellow dots in the world? We knew where people were traveling to, um, and, and this is, it makes sense that that's going to be the first place where this disease is spread. At this point, it's in most places of the world. A little, it's so far, it's rare in Africa and rare in South America, um, but the rest of the world has cases. If you go through an airport today, you might see um, a, a screen uh, set up like this, where they have a scanner, and they're looking at everyone coming in the room, and they're doing a, uh, a just an overall infrared scan of the, the patient's body, and they're trying to measure the body temperature. And this is an easy way to scan a lot of people very quickly. It's not very accurate. It's probably not very effective for controlling disease, but it's something that you will see. At the front door to Ognol, you guys are now having a more uh, rigorous screening where you're asking people where they've been and you're checking everyone's individual temperature. And that's a probably much more effective way of, of screening for at-risk uh, population. One of the challenges that we have with this disease there's two challenges. One challenge is, is that you can transmit the disease with having very minimal symptoms, and I'll talk about more than that. And the other challenge is, we've known since the days of the SARS epidemic that coronaviruses, like SARS, like MERS, like COVID, can spread in certain people uh, just much more. They're, they're called super spreaders. They, for some reason, they shed viruses at a relatively higher rate than the rest of the population. We don't know why this is. Um, and it just so happened that there was a super spreader who introduced the disease um, to France and to, to London. He was, he was a, a British man in Singapore for a conference. From there, he got a, a acquired the disease. He didn't know it. He flew to a ski vacation in southern France, in the Alps of France. That started a cluster in that, in that ski location. And then on to, uh, on to London, where he created a cluster is there as well. And that super spreader phenomenon may be part of the explanation for why the Diamond Princess cruise ship did so poorly. I do want to pause and talk about this cruise ship for, uh, for a few moments because I think it's a really interesting and really important um, lesson. What happened to the Diamond, cruise, Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan is really a tragedy for those who were there, but for the rest of us, has given us a chance to have, basically have a natural experiment that, that talks a lot about the epidemiology of this particular disease. January 20th, people board this vessel in Yokohama, Japan, for a cruise around uh, to Hong Kong and around the China Sea. On January 25th, there's someone on board who's sick. 
gets off, off the, the boat in Hong Kong and goes and seeks treatment there. Well, on February 1st, that patient was identified to actually have this, have COVID. And the ship is notified, the Japanese authorities are notified, the ship is stopped when it returns to Yokohama on the 4th, and people are kept on board. And the idea is we're going to keep people on the board, we're going to quarantine them there, we're going to identify who's sick, take them off if they get sick, but otherwise people are going to stay on board um, for 14 days for the, uh, for the quarantine period. It's February 6th, 41, 41 people test positive. A couple days later, 66 more people test positive. Then 39 people more test positive. Finally, at this point, the United States has had enough, and they said that this is just, we're going to take our citizens off the boat. And they send a plane, and they take the United States citizens off the boat. Uh, for those who were sick, stayed, stayed in, um, in, in Tokyo, and everyone else who was well went back on the plane. But there were 14 people on that plane that tested positive for the disease and continued to spread it. Um, within that new community. Meanwhile, back on the ship, um, the number of cases just keeps growing through the end of that incubation period. Finally, total of 700, 691 cases out of those 3,700 people um, of crash and crew um, got sick. And to date, seven people died. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this, from this uh, situation? Is if you keep people on a cruise ship, with a couple infected cases, this disease will spread. Why? One thing we know is that two-thirds, two-thirds of all the cases of COVID on that cruise ship were asymptomatic. So two-thirds of all the patients who had COVID didn't even know they had it and were spreading to people. That is very important to understand um, we have the disease within our community that you may not actually know that you're sick and you can still spread it. And that's absolutely happening. One of the big questions come up is, is this droplet or aerosol transmission? So let me pause and explain what that means. Droplet is a type of isolation. It's the isolation that we use for influenza as well as meningitis and most diseases like that. And what it involves is you just take a simple surgical mask and you put it on the patient's mouth, and therefore the droplets, so if they spray out in a normal por por portion of coughing or conversation, that is the infectious materials, and that mass then keeps that from spraying out of their mouth. If you have droplet isolation, if you are within, if you stay more than six feet away, if you more, stay more than two meters away, you should be safe. You shouldn't be able to transmit it further than that. There's a few diseases, most notably measles, Chicken pox, also tuberculosis, that is spread by airborne or aerosol transmission. And this means the viral particles are so fine, are, are so hardy, that they can sit in the air for up to an hour or more. The patient doesn't have to be in the room and someone can go in and they can get sick from that. That's aerosol transmission. That's the highest form of transmission. So for those patients, we use the N95 mask, which you may have heard about. What the N95 is, it blocks. 95% of particles that are 0.3 microns or larger. And those are the masks, that, the highest quality masks, and we're going to use those for airborne transmission. So with the Diamond Princess, there was concern that maybe people are sitting in their cabins, they're spreading it through the ventilation system by aerosol transmission. We don't think that's going to happen while it's possible. In fact, it was so possible that the CDC, in fact, changed their recommendations for this disease because of this outbreak. Prior to this, prior to the Diamond Princess cruise, the recommendation was maintaining people in droplet isolation with COVID. Now the recommendation is to put those patients in airborne isolation when they're in the hospital. But I think the other important take-home point from the Diamond Princess is it's not just about the transmission. It probably is droplet but it can also transmit on surfaces, and we've known this since the days of the SARS epidemic, is absolutely transmittable by surfaces. So when someone spits on the surface, someone touches a, uh, touches a door handle, um, touches an elevator button, a vomits on the carpet, that is enough for people then to get the disease. So it's easy that it could have been transmitted just from a surface within that, within that uh, cruise ship. Unfortunately, this situation being played out again in California, 
Now with the Grand Princess, I'm a cruise attorney from Hawaii to San Francisco, and there were a couple of cases identified on the ship, and the, at first the ship was told to sit and stay and not dock because they didn't want those people to come into San Francisco. They wanted to make, make arrangements. There's a headline that said, we can't screw this up again. We don't want to sit, have people sit on that cruise ship for 14 days and become an incubator for further disease. So fortunately, over the weekend, it was decided this ship would, would dock in Oakland and the patients will be taken to isolation facilities, which is the right way to handle it. So what do you do about masks? We talked about masks. Do you need masks? You don't need masks. You don't need masks unless you're sick. If you're sick, you want to wear a mask so you can protect others um, from getting sick. And there's a lot of very uh, crazy pictures out there doing the mask shortage um, in Asia and throughout the world um, where people are treating this as viral, uh, viral commodities. Where this, there's a, Here's a picture of people playing poker and using the mask as poker chips. Um, there's a family that's covered their entire uh, family in plastic wrap. And I thought this was very clever. Um, someone made a mask out of an orange, um, which I guess would smell better, but not necessarily particularly effective. You don't need a mask for routine use around the community. That's okay, unless you're sick. You want to preserve the masks, um, especially those N95 masks, for use in a healthcare setting where, where you're going to be taking care of uh, sick people. Where I need the N95 mask to work in the emergency department and taking care of sick people. Um, home uh, people coming to visit uh, you in your home um, may need masks um, if you get sick, for example, and, and they're they're taking care of you. One of my favorite movies of all time is called Contagion, and this is a about a fictional uh, pandemic of a new virus, which was based in large part on the SARS epidemic. And if you go back and watch this now, it's very relevant. It's very scary, but it's also very relevant. Uh, and models what this disease could do if the mortality was higher. Now, in the, the fictional disease of contagion has a 20% mortality rate. That's very significant, and that would be very, very dangerous. The mortality rate for this disease, for COVID, is much lower. It's probably 0.5 to 1%, but yes, definitely higher in, in, in the population in Oakland, so we need to be concerned about that. But overall, um, much less deadly than the fictional virus in Contagion. But this is, movie is definitely worth seeing because you can get a sense of how public measures can break down and how panic can ensue in a community. And it's tag, the tagline for the movie is perfect, nothing spreads like fear. And I think we're definitely seeing that today now. So what's coming in terms of treatments? There are a number of vaccine candidates uh, in, in, uh, in the pipeline. Um, and there was a number of candidates that were already being studied for MERS, so Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the, another coronavirus. So there's some viruses, that were, there were some vaccines for MERS that are being tested now for COVID. Um, and we actually have the first vaccine that's entered human trials entering this month. Um, that's called it's called uh, it's from the company called Moderna. Um, and in case you're interested, that's the uh, stock price for Moderna last week was uh, twenty-seven dollars. If, you, if you're interested, in it. I don't know if that's going to be the effective vaccine. There's a number of other candidates in China that are also entering human trials as early as next month, which is really really remarkably fast. Um, we won't have an effective vaccine for use for at least a year. So we just need to be aware of that. In the meantime, there are some antiviral treatments, possibly. Um, there's this me a medicine called Remdesivir, which was developed uh, for, uh, for, 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 the, for Ebola, which was not particularly effective for Ebola, but now it's being tested against COVID. Um, they've already enrolled a number of patients in Nebraska uh, for treatment with this disease, um, and I think there are still um, some opportunities to get enrolled if someone gets very sick. So we might see um, some some people enrolled in a clinical trial for this disease. There's a num there's a number uh, a couple of other um, uh, antivirals have been tested, um, like falavir, it's basically a new anti-influenza uh, medication. We've also tried some of the uh, highly active 
antiretroviral therapy, so medications we use for HIV. Um, it's been reported in the literature. They don't seem to be particularly effective. What's also been reported in the literature is chloroquine, which we've used for years for malaria. Um, we're not sure why, but it seems to work in the lab, in a, in a, in a petri dish, in vitro, it works for, for viruses in general. We don't know if it works for COVID. Initial reports are not very promising, but it is being used in China on experimental therapy. So what are we going to see? What's, what's going to happen in the future? And I think you're seeing a lot of that happen already. There is absolutely going to be slowed economic growth. Um, certainly the stock market has been affected. Um, the supply chain has been interrupted. Absolutely, members of the leisure industry like airlines and cruise ships or uh, hotels are definitely going to be affected as conferences are canceled. Um, we've seen some panic buying, uh, and unfortunately panic buying of masks, uh, which makes them less available for healthcare workers. Hand sanitizer is very hard to find these days. Um, I do not know why people are buying toilet paper. You do not need to buy toilet paper for this disease. There's nothing about this disease that makes you, makes you need, more, nor, need more toilet paper. Um, one of the dangers that we run into in the future is going to be crowding of healthcare facilities. So right now, it's under control. We're screening people as they come in to the University of Iowa Hospital. Uh, we're restricting visitors. That's been, uh, we've been able to, to stay ahead of this. In some communities, say in Seattle, um, say in Northern Italy, for example, um, the disease has gotten to the point where it's really stressing the healthcare, um, the healthcare uh, facilities, especially the number of ICU beds, and that's one of the dangers in the future. What happens in meetings? Well, clearly, we're not meeting right now, and that's an example of, of one of the precautions taken to increase social distancing I and mean, keep people apart. Uh, in France, they've, they've banned uh, gatherings of more than a thousand people. Um, you might have just uh, heard that the Southwest, South by Southwest conference in um, uh, in Austin, Texas, which was was recently canceled. That's a really big deal. It's a really big tech conference um, that was canceled. There are other um, there are other conferences as well around the world. It's not just the United States. Um, for example, in Saudi Arabia, they've closed Mecca to um, to to worship for now. Now the Hajj or the annual pilgrimage to Mecca is scheduled for later on this summer. Um, we don't know if those restrictions will still be in place by that time. We don't know if people will be available. Um, is it going to affect the Hawkeye football season? At this point, probably not. Or probably things will be back to normal by the time the fall comes around. But um, it could definitely affect the NCAA tournament, the basketball tournament. Um, some of those games may need to be played without actually having people in, in attendance. We certainly have seen the um, panic buying. This is the pictures of some shelves uh, in, in markets with there's, there's no paper, toilet paper. I went to Heidi this morning just to check on what the situation is. They have plenty of toilet paper. They have plenty of soap. They have plenty of cleaning products. Those are fine. Yes, the hand sanitizer is unavailable, but everything else is still there. There is no need to panic buy toilet paper. But if you are living in um, independent living, if you're living on your own, um, having access to extra food is probably a good idea. Now, you guys are fine here because you'll probably be able to eat um, in, in, in your, you know, like I said, in, in, the, in, the, in the restaurant, but um, I would advise your families um, to go ahead and have two weeks of food on hand just in case. If you are quarantined, if you are put in isolation, um, if you're asked to stay at home for two weeks, it's good to have that food available. What's going to happen in the next couple weeks? You're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of cases in the United States. And that is simply a reflection of increased testing. It doesn't change what the epidemic is going on right now. We are on the upslope of the epidemic in the United States. I'm not sure when it will peak. It might peak in April or May, but we are on the upslope of that, of that epidemic. You're going to hear about a lot more positive cases not just in Iowa, but throughout the country in the next couple of weeks because we're just catching up to testing. So what this graph shows is the number of tests performed uh, per million people across a couple of different affected countries. South Korea has been very aggressive about testing. They've set up testing centers. They've had people drive through the testing centers where they're getting swabbed, they're getting swabbed as they go through, um, and you're testing a large portion of the population. That's how you identify a large number of cases. The United States is 
way behind in that, in that respect. We're getting there. We've gotten to the point where we now have the test available at our hospital, and we can test um, anyone we need, we need to, but um, we're really behind on that. So what do you do? What do you do about travel? This is a very fluid situation, and it's changing daily. The recommendations that I would have given you a week ago are different. They are they're different today, just what's happened over the weekend. So pay attention to the CDC website. Pay attention to the State Department website. Um, there's going to be uh, the, as as those recommendations change. As of Friday, the CDC has recommended that people over 60 should not go out as much as possible. Should uh, remain inside um, when they can. That doesn't mean you need to be barricaded inside the open facility. That's okay. But you probably want to reduce your activities. Avoid large crowds, for example. Okay. Um, avoid uh, uh, traveling. You don't need to need to do. Hand washing, cleaning services, super important. Okay. Um, if you have travel planned domestically, it's probably fine at this point. Um, to still go or to plan to go or to plan to go this summer, um, but that could change. As of last night, the State Department is recommending that Americans don't go on a cruise ship. Okay? For this community, for the Oakland community, I would not recommend a cruise ship anytime in the near future. Okay? Um, that is definitely a, a high risk type of exposure. International travel in general. All right, this is a little bit tricky. And again, if you're a high-risk patient, if you're a member of the Oakland community, probably don't want to do any international planning, any international travel at this point. If you are looking at scheduling something down the line, maybe later on this fall, it might be okay by then. Um, any, new, any new travel that you purchase, make sure you get travel insurance, and make sure you get a cancel for any reason part of that, of that travel insurance. So you can cancel for, for, for if, if the, the epidemic continues. Um, Right now, Central America, South America, even Africa, is relatively low risk. There's just not a lot of cases there. Mexico is perfectly safe. Okay, so um, if you, ha you know, if you have family members going to Mexico, really nothing, nothing to really be concerned about at this point. Any travel, any travel that you do at this point, um, starting, you know, starting now, really, you have a risk of quarantine. If you travel to an area and that area that becomes a high risk location for COVID, quarantine could be, could be imposed. So you need to take that into account, you need to include that in your sort of assessment of risk. Um, that's just such a possibility. Um, what can you do around, around here? Social distancing, not avoiding large crowds. Again, hand, hand washing is super important, um, and stay home if you're sick, wear a mask. I love this, um, uh, there's been a lot of advice about like, like how do you hand wash? Wash your hands like you convince your husband to murder the rightful king, and then you can't get the blood off. Um, so I think that's a great reference, great uh, Shakespearean reference that would be, be relevant for the uh, liter literary community of Iowa City. Now myself, I, I like Shakespeare, but I really prefer science fiction, so I thought this one was great. This is How Do You Hand Wash and You Recite the Litany of Fear from the Dune Books by, by Frank Herbert as you're washing. I think it was a really good way to do it. If you need a simpler explanation of how you hand wash, this one from Texas is really good. Wash your hands just like you just got done slicing jalapenos and you need to take your contacts out. Okay, so um, just be really good about cleaning your hands. So take home points. It is okay to be scared, but do not panic. We need to maintain surveillance, so we need to test a lot more patients. You're going to see a big increase in the number of cases. That's okay. That just means we're finally catching up to the testing that we need to do. Okay, that doesn't mean that the epidemic is spreading any more than it has. Um, so identify those cases and isolate them. Hand washing is much more important than wearing a face mask, but wear a face mask if you're sick. Um, and of course, we're gonna all waiting for that vaccine development, which is still about a year away. Thank you very much.